Hey guys, we're here today to talk about the Atlesian Battlecruiser, or that's what I call it, and I'm going to explain why, uh, and uh, about this ship. Now, I don't know everything about this ship. I don't think any of us do. There's maybe some drawings and other things out there, but this is more speculation. I want to see how close I can get to what this ship actually turns out to be. And... So I'm just going to guess. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But it's just to guess and see. So, there is also one other point to this, and is that I want to break down this ship because I believe it has a massive reflection on General Ironwood. And I want to do a character analysis of General Ironwood, so I want to get this out of the way so I can reference this later on. With that said, let's begin. And we're going to start with not even the ship itself, but we're going to start with my term, why I call it a battle cruiser. First, we're going to break down the word battle. The battle cruiser designation means battle meaning in that is that it's supposed to stand in the line of battle. It's supposed to stand there and throw punches and uh, take hits and other things. But this is slightly different from the traditional battleship that we would think in our world, because this thing well, as you noticed, does not float. It sits up in the air. So this is far more of an air support, an air domination kind of ship. It is supposed to sit up there and provide artillery fire for the ground troops. But it is in the line of battle and is a key component to a battle conducted by the Elysian military. So that's why I believe that it holds that point. It is a massive support vehicle in the line of battle. Next, let's break down the word cruiser. Cruiser designates that it goes anywhere in the world, which, being a flying ship, yes, it can go anywhere in the world. It can go from Menagerie to Vacuo to Vale to Mistral and all the places in between. This allows the Elysian military to operate anywhere, which you can see General Ironwood wanting so that he could fight Salem. So this makes a lot of sense, but it also makes sense for what I think the origin of this ship is because there's another entity in Atlas that could really use a ship like this. To be able to go all across the world and protect and clear out places and uh, protect shipments. That would be the SDC, the Schnee Dust Company. I believe that there is a corporate version of this ship, probably less armed, less militarized and other things, but still fulfills a very similar role that it goes around the world and absolutely eliminates Grimm. And that when the Elysian military saw this, they thought this would be a fantastic weapon to incorporate into our military. And it has really helped the Elysian military become an anti-Grimm force. So this thing is absolutely amazing. You can imagine a young Huntsman Ironwood staring up at these things flying through the air and going, that's exactly what I need my military. You can also imagine him then finding out about Salem and thinking this is the weapon that is going to defeat Salem. Now as we know that's not really an option but he obviously didn't know that at the time. It also has several faults that we will explore here in just a minute. These aren't perfect weapons. They do have their faults. All right. We're going to move on to mechanics. So, first and foremost, we need to talk about the giant spikes sticking off the Elysian airship. I suspect these are where the gravity dust is stored to keep this thing up in the air. Now, more than likely, like in our real world, it has a natural power, very similar to like magnets, that it will naturally resist gravity. But if you ran an electric current through it, it probably enhances that ability. So I suspect that these things are being enhanced by uh, electrical current running through them. I also suspect that they are jutting out away from each other because they interfere with one another when they are too close. So they have to be spread out. Now the strange part about this is that this thing is, these spikes are keeping the ship in the air, but they're not protected in any way, which really speaks to the, one of the big advantages which we're about to get to about this ship. It's up in the air, which 
everyone thinks, oh, okay, it just it's cool, it's up near. It actually has an enormous amount of advantages in a world like Remnant. And the first and foremost is being these things are almost untouchable by normal Grim. Now, normal Grim, I mean Beowulfs, Ursas, Goliaths, uh, all these other things. They're the normal standard Grim. And they're pretty much untouchable because they're all ground attack Grim. They're not designed to fight um, air to air combat, meaning that this thing is essentially impervious to them. Most Grim can't hurt this thing, and so it can just sit up top and blast away at these things. Meaning, it looks like this thing is relatively lightly armored, and as we saw, Ruby kicked a Grim straight through the top of one of these things, so yeah, they're probably not very armored at all. But their sheer presence of being up in the air seems to deter Grim. Think back to the Griffin Grim in Volume 3. When they first invaded, they just ignored these ships. They didn't know what to do with them, because they normally didn't see them. Now these Griffin Grims are probably normally used to Veil, and they don't usually see Edlesian airships sitting above them. But it speaks highly to how the Grim perceive them. They do not see these things as normal, and they get a little confused when they see them. So there's a big advantage for sitting up in the air. This allows the ships to do their next part, which we're getting to, which is fire support. As I said when I discussed about line of battle, these things are designed to sit up in the air and act as weapons platforms for artillery fire, for ground close air support for the gunships, for uh, communications, which we saw them connect all the uh, Lysian knights, and information gathering. They are essentially support vehicles for an entire battle. This is a massively important job and really shows our next point is about combined arms. This doctrine of using artillery combined with infantry, combined with heavy support vehicles, which would be the paladins, combined with uh, air support and close air support, uh, meaning the battle cruisers themselves and the gunships. This combining all these together into one thing is called combined arms. This concept is, in our world, is only relatively new, being about to only a hundred or so years old at this point. So that Ironwood understand it really speaks to him understanding warfare and reinforces the idea that Ironwood is a very intelligent man. Now, this video isn't about Ironwood. That'll be for the character analysis I plan on doing later, but this really speaks to just how much he understands his combat, or at least thinks he does. Which again is why I wanted to do this video before I did Ironwood's character analysis. And finally we gotta talk about the hangers. The hangers are weird. Not because they're wrong or anything, or they're strange and don't work, it's just traditionally in sci-fi, other animes, and other things, hangers are horizontal. The Elysian Battlecruiser has vertical hangar bays. They more than likely support the Elysian gunships we all know and love, but it probably slides them in there like racks in an oven, stacking one on top of the other, which is strange. It's not wrong or anything, it's just different, and I love it. It's just weird. I suspect the hangar bays probably contain three to four gunships per, meaning that a standard Elysian battlecruiser probably has 12 to 16 gunships per ship. A good complement about three to four squadrons. And these things probably don't operate alone, so there's probably three in a division. So in an entire division, there's probably between 36 to 58, I'm doing math on the top of my head here, uh, gunships in a division, which is a significant portion that you would move around to clear out spaces. I mean, these things are amazingly well designed and look great, but they do have flaws, as I said. And we're gonna get into that in the next part. So, 
Now on to whether or not these things are actually good and their faults, which I keep hinting at. They are actually a good idea. They work fantastic. You can see why the Elysian military adopted these vehicles. They are absolutely amazing. But like I said, they have a fault. And the first one comes in with inflexibility. They don't give you an ability to change your strategy. You have to go with this combined arms and you can never really change it. Once you get a Grim that has air-to-air -air combat and can outmaneuver the gunships and get around and there's a large enough swarms to overwhelm the battle cruisers, which again is probably why they work in like a division of three, they don't really have any other defense. They're lightly armed. It would not take an incredible amount of time to knock these things out. We see in volume eight, the jellyfish grim ripping these things apart in the background. We can imagine the Beringil grim landing on top and ripping the, uh, the armor plating up and tearing the systems to pieces, causing the ship to crash. They're not designed for air to air combat and this limits their ability. They're a good thing. But they have a problem in that the man who chose this design kept thinking he was going to fight normal Grimm. He forgot who he's fighting. He created a weapon designed to fight the enemy he wanted to fight, and not the enemy he was faced with. He saw this as an anti-Grimm weapon. The problem is an anti-Grimm weapon will not work against Salem. She can design and design her Grim far faster than you could ever design a ship. Meaning a less effective but more traditional form of military combat probably would have been better than this ship, as it would have given you a lot of flexibility. Even just a smaller version of this ship with more armor plating, less hangar bays, and more just defense so that it can hold its position probably would have worked out far better as it would have been able to provide covering fire for the troops. Right now, these battlecruisers have to sit behind the front line and fire down into it, because if they get in front of the troops, they'll be destroyed. And then there's the whole other problem of these things are fantastic against Grimm, but are probably useless against people. Again, the massive laser, dust laser cannons on them probably do not have a fantastic range probably I wouldn't guess more than 10 kilometers and you could get just basic artillery to outrange the things and with their light armor you could pierce them right away these things can't fight other human armies and why would humans fight humans I mean we're fighting Salem well Salem manipulates people and it wouldn't be hard to turn people against Atlas so I would like to see Cordovan try to take over the world with these things. As she said, she would fight the whole world if they wanted to turn against Atlas. It wouldn't go well for them. It is a force multiplier system that is absolutely amazing, but it shows a level of tunnel vision on Atlas's part. They stopped fighting the enemy they were facing, and they start fighting the enemy they wanted to face. Well, not so much Atlas as Ironwood himself, but you get my point. They're absolutely beautiful and stunning ships. Absolutely love their design. But they're also a tragedy because they are doomed to fail in their task. They are doomed to lose to the enemy they have been faced with. And there's no chance for them. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Uh, I'm going to do more videos. As I said, character analysis is going to become up at some point when I eventually get time to write them all down into thoughts and then turn them into a video. Uh, but for now, if you want to see more content from me, subscribe to this channel, like the video. Uh, you can also check out my gaming channel at Neo47Games. Uh, I do mostly grand strategy and other things, but uh, it's a fun time over there. Until next time, I hope you have a great day, and I will see you then. Bye.